I'm Dr. Dana Alia. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am a full-time faculty member here at uh, MUIH and also a graduate of the Doctor of Clinical Nutrition program. So I finished the program in uh, 2020. So tonight I'm going to be presenting you a case study on one of my patients. And I wanted to choose someone who not only is interesting, but also that uh, is is current as well. So you'll see when we go through the case that my most recent session with this patient was just on Friday. So give me a moment and uh, so I can share my screen and I'll be able to uh, give you all the ins and outs of the, this interesting case. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We will have some time at the end of the session that uh, hopefully I'll be able to address all of them. If not, I'll be happy to share my email address and I can always connect with you if for some reason um, we're not able to get through all the questions tonight. All righty. So I'm going to give you all the, the details of my case. So we're going to look at this from a, a more integrative approach. And you'll see when I start to give you the background information for this client that my intake form that I use in my private practice is specifically geared to focus on things through a, a more integrative and functional lens. So today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, my patient who we'll refer to as JB. She is a 58 year old female. And the first time that I saw her in consult, our initial consultation was back in July 21st of uh, 2021. And at that point, her weight was 148 pounds. She was 5'6". And weight was not the reason why she was reaching out and scheduling consult for me. And what I've listed in a lot of these slides are her direct answers directly from my intake form. So one of the first things that I ask my clients on their intake form is, you know, how would they rate their health? And when was the last time they felt well? So she rated her overall health as good, but she was dealing with a lot of digestive issues, a lot of long-term gut issues. And her words exactly was when uh, the gut was not happy, the body's not happy. So she was already tuned into looking at things from a more integrative approach because we do look at the, the gut as really being ground zero for whole body health. And the main three concerns or the reasons why she was seeking a consult with me was she felt that she had a lot of food triggers, that she was experiencing a lot of reactions to foods, and she wanted to be able to focus on improving her gut health with the hope that she would be able to be more liberal with her diet and be able to eat more foods again. And that question of when the last time she felt well, she had stated that she had really been struggling with these GI issues for a, a little over a decade. So it had been 10 years since the last time that she felt well. And another important question is, you know, what was uh, something that a client or patient, and you'll see, I use that term client and patient interchangeably, but when what was a trigger that uh, your patient or client might feel um, really led to a change in their health status. So for JB, she said that, you know, she wanted to have an understanding of how, what were her triggering foods and how to get them under control. So that way she could have a more inclusive diet. In terms of things that made her feel better, she was relying a lot on drinking coconut water and just really eating white rice, especially when she was experiencing some flares in her digestive health. And for that question of what was making her feel worse, she actually had a relatively lengthy list of foods that she was reacting poorly to. Her current medications was levothyroxine. So she was on thyroid medication and she had been on that since 2012. And she was on a pretty steady dose of 75 micrograms. And she had reported to me that that had been a very long-term dose for her. Uh, her self-prescribed supplements at that point, she was taking a fish oil supplement, a multivitamin. She was taking a relatively low dose of vitamin D. And then she was also taking a combo product that was providing her with some calcium, magnesium, and also zinc. 
And for medical history, she had been diagnosed by her primary care provider in 2010 with IBSD. However, she had not been seen by a gastroenterologist. Uh, she did test positive for Epstein-Barr virus back in 1988. She was also diagnosed with asthma in that year. In 2020, her primary care doc had diagnosed her with anxiety, and she did have a thyroidectomy in 2012, thus the reason for her levothyroxine, and she did have foot surgery, a bunionectomy in 2005. Her overall regular health history, she was pretty um, on track with her dental visits. She did not have any mercury amalgam fill fillings. She was born by a normal vaginal delivery, and she'd reported that she had a relatively healthy childhood. She did not suffer from a lot, lot of infections, um, and she didn't have any other health history as a child. Her family history included that her mother had passed of breast cancer at age 50, and her father died of a cerebral vascular accident at age 71. And she was unfamiliar with what the health history was for her grandparents on both sides of the family. In terms of her present diet, when she first came into my practice in 2021, she was trying to do her own elimination diet. So at that point, she had removed gluten, egg, corn, soy, and dairy from her diet, but she was eating three meals and at least one snack per day. And she said she had a relatively healthy appetite and she would honor that by eating when she felt hungry and stopping when she felt food, felt full. Um, she didn't eat out very often, so she said she reported about 25% or less of her daily, of her weekly meals was eaten out. She did like to cook. She did like to shop. Eating organic foods was very important to her, so she did place a high emphasis on the quality of the foods that she was consuming. But she did have some comfort foods and nuts and chocolate, but she really wasn't able to eat some of her favorites because of the degree of digestive issues she was experiencing. She didn't have any textural issues or any food aversions, although rice pudding or soggy cereal were things that kind of turned her off. And she did focus on her hydration and she reported that she was eat, drinking adequate amounts of fluid each day. So to include a little bit of her, her own narrative. So in my intake form, I do give patients an opportunity to free text information that they would want to relay to me before we meet for our first session. And I ask my clients to submit their intake paperwork at least 48 hours prior to our scheduled appointment. So that way I have an opportunity to actually review all of their paperwork and then also start to formulate some questions that I might have for them and also begin to think about, you know, what's my clinical reasoning and critical thinking gonna start to tease out some of the items that I might think as uh, on the included list of some mitigating factors and what I might be already able to start removing based on their intake. So it was really important for her to get a true handle on the foods that she can or cannot eat, but she also wanted to understand what's the root cause? Why was she experiencing uh, such a continual amount of IBSD type symptoms? and it was drastically decreasing her available foods. She also noted that she did have a dental issue a couple of years ago and had developed C. diff after she needed to go on a course of antibiotics. And then I've also listed here for you what she self-reported as her allergy information. And she listed multiple food allergies. However, when I probed her further in our first session, these were not true IgE um, diagnosed allergies. So a lot of times you'll find that clients will often confuse food allergy, food sensitivity, or food intolerance. And if somebody doesn't feel well or doesn't or has a reaction to a food, whether it be digestive or systematically elsewhere, a lot of folks will automatically just say, I'm allergic to that food. So she listed that, you know, these foods that she has here as food allergies are really just more of the foods that were causing some of her symptoms. At this point, she had not done any food allergy testing, nor had she had any food sensitivity or intolerance. She was also somebody who reported that she was sensitive to a lot of medications. So um, anytime she was prescribed a medication throughout her life, she would always start much at a much lower dose and titrate it up because she was quite sensitive. 
Um, she's also very sensitive to the sun and that she burns very quickly. And then when I met with her, I noted that she was a redhead who is fair skinned and she does have blue eyes. So she is somebody who can be a little bit more sun sensitive to sun exposure. And she did report that she also had some mild seasonal allergy symptoms from time to time, sneezing and, and itchy eyes. So eating habits, she did like to eat, she liked to cook, although she was really starting to get very confused over nutrition advice and the symptoms that she was associating. She had done a lot of doctor Googling and she had also shared with me that she was also having consults with a few other practitioners. So she was kind of spreading it all out there. She was working with a naturopathic provider. She was also going to be working with a functional medicine physician. She was also dealing with um, an Asian acupuncture physician who was also focusing a lot on uh, Eastern traditional Chinese medicine. So she was trying to cover all of her bases. Um, bowel movements, it really varied. She was struggling with a lot of diarrhea, but she would have some periods of, of normal stools. But when she was keeping food journals, she wasn't able to kind of pinpoint any rhyme or reason. I also spend a lot of time asking questions about their lifestyle, their sleep quality, stressors, because we do want to look at that integrative approach and all of the other factors that can be contributing to somebody's current presentation. So she was a non-smoker. She also said she wasn't using any sort of recreational drugs. She also doesn't tolerate alcohol, so she wasn't drinking. But stressors, uh, she did report her, her work stress was a two, and she's actually a volunteer coordinator for a hospice agency. And she reported in our session that she does get a lot of satisfaction from her job. So that was not an area that gave her a lot of stress. She, her family stress was at a four and she did say in session that the majority of the family stress was really a revolving around her ever increasing GI symptoms and her decreasing list of foods that she was, that she felt safe with. Social stress was, was low financial stress. She rated a two, but her health, on a scale of one to 10, she rated very high. And that was because of this, you know, um, increasing uh, decades worth of GI symptoms. But she did have some stress management techniques that she was using. So she did practice meditation on a daily basis. And she also really enjoyed engaging in mindfulness-based practices. She also utilized breathing techniques. She kept a gratitude journal as well. So she felt like she was really comfortable and confident with some of her stress relieving and her relaxation practices. Um, but in terms of whether or not her life has meaning or purpose, she actually rated that as unsure because she was struggling with these GI issues and felt like she was starting to, um, it was impacting some of the choices that she can make in her life. When we focus on sleep, she did rate that her sleep quality, uh, she was getting six to eight hours during the week. She was sleeping more on the weekends and she um, doesn't necessarily have trouble falling asleep, but there were times where she would wake up 15 minutes after falling asleep. She does feel rested upon waking, but not always. And she, in session, when I asked some clarifying questions, it was directly tied to the days that she was having uh, an increased amount of her GI symptoms. That usually led to poor sleep that night because she was uh, ruminating and stressing and worried about whether or not she was gonna have bouts of diarrhea the next day. She normally would wake up two times to urinate at night, but she ra rated her overall sleep quality a three on a scale of one to five. So that was kind of middle of the road. But from an integrative perspective, in my opinion, that meant that we definitely had some room for improvement to help improve the quality of her sleep. For her activity questionnaire, she did say that she was engaging a few times a week in some mild stretching and yoga. She wasn't doing uh, any sort of structured classes. A lot of this she was doing at home, either before work or after work. She did have a cardio aerobic video that she was doing six days a week. That was a 30 minute video. She was doing a little bit of strength training. She had some light weights that she was doing, but she didn't. She wasn't involved in any structured sports or leisure activities. 
On the environmental exposure questionnaire, she denied any exposures. And as I mentioned earlier, she was a, uh, a volunteer coordinator for a local hospice center. And then here on the right side of the slide, you'll see these are my readiness to change questions. And I ask clients to rate it on a scale of one to five, meaning one, that they're really not ready to engage in this action or change, and five, being absolutely I'm ready to jump in, let's go. So for modifying her diet, she said her readiness was at a four, keeping a food journal was at a five, Modifying her lifestyle was a four, engaging in exercise a four, uh, her relaxation was a five. Um, she was already doing that. Uh, taking nutritional supplements was a five and having periodic lab tests was also going to be a four. I, just, I saw a question pop up, so I just wanted to make sure that everything was going well. I'll answer your questions at, at the end. And then my intake form also incorporates a digestive questionnaire, which she scored 22 on cumulatively, which means that she is experiencing a moderate to severe degree of GI issues. And you can see I've broken them down by occasionally, frequently, and often as to what she selected um, as the items that were uh, flagged on her digestive questionnaire. So she was occasionally dealing with excessive burping or belching and bloating. She was also occasionally dealing with stomach spasms and cramping. Uh, she feels hungry an hour or two after consuming a meal. And she was also getting, you know, occasional periods of uh, experiencing some stomach pain or aching that could last anywhere from one to four hours after her meal. And from a frequent perspective, eating spicy or fatty foods were causing symptoms. Chocolate, coffee, and alcohol were causing symptoms. Um, she would frequently have a bowel movement within an hour of consuming a meal. And she also frequently said she was getting pain discomfort in her lower abdominal area. And then she was also getting frequently, uh, she noticed changes in the quality of her stool and she throughout the day. So she would start off with very loose stools in the morning and then they would bulk up a little bit during the day. And she was also frequently having uh, three or more bowel movements per day. In her uh, symptom questionnaire, she scored a 47. So this is an additional questionnaire that I include in my intake form that is separate than her digestive questionnaire. So from her multi-symptom questionnaire overall, she scored a 47, which means that she was dealing with, with a major amount of symptoms from head to toe. And then when I did the nutrition-focused physical exam, for her. Um, things that I noted was she did have a pale tongue. Um, she also had uh, paleness in her cheeks as well as in, in the conjunctivas of her eyes, which could be associated with low iron or iron deficiency, potentially even anemias. Um, she had what we know, we re refer to as a geographic tongue. So you actually see some textural changes on the tongue, which can also be associated with deficiencies or insufficiencies of folate, B12, and zinc. And for some people, it can be just a, a genetic predisposition to having a geographic tongue, which means that's gonna be unchangeable. So it's not going to be related to a micronutrient deficiency. When I evaluated her skin, I did note that she had dry, dry skin, which can be associated with an essential fatty acid deficiency, vitamin A, or even zinc. She did have dark circles under the eyes, which can be uh, associated with allergies, either food or environmental allergies. She did have bumps on the back of her arms, which is generally a sign of an omega-3 fatty acid, so those essential fatty acid deficiencies. And it could also be a sign of uh, vitamin A insufficiencies. Uh, for some people, it can be related to eczema, but she did not have eczema. 
And then her fingernails were also very weak and thin. They did bend easily. And she did note that if she wasn't going for frequent manicures, that they would crack and ship. So that can be a sign of potential low stomach acid or essential fatty acid in insufficiencies and also calcium and zinc or micronutrients of concern. When she shared with me her labs, um, all of her labs were in within normal limits, as well as the uh, integrative and more functional optimal limits, except for her vitamin D level. So throughout the course of seeing her, I did have access to three uh, values for her vitamin D. So in June of 2021, her vitamin D level, her serum level was 27. Then in August of 21, it went up to 83. And we'll get to that in a moment as to why that increase. And then recently, this past year, in March of 23, it went back down to 37. So I had my initial consult with her on uh, July 21st of 21. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, she was also working with some other practitioners. So she had al already seen uh, a functional medicine physician who had diagnosed her with dysbiosis, and also a vitamin D deficiency. And that practitioner had placed her on vitamin D 50,000 international units for two weeks, and then told her to drop it down to 10,000 IUs per day. Um, they also put her on a supportive supplement known as SBI Protect, which is a combination product that gives some uh, immunoglobulins. And they had them start off of uh, just taking one pill per day because she was afraid that it was going to bind her and cause too much constipation. Um, that practitioner also recommended some L-glutamine powder, a progesterone cream, and also put her on a product called Hist Complete because that physician told the patient that her histamine level was a little bit high. So she had was just about to start these supplements. Uh, she had also done a stool test with that other practitioner um, that showed up to be negative. So there weren't any um, parasites, there weren't any pathogens, and everything looked good in that stool kit that that other provider had ordered. So when I met with her, we had discussed, I'm a big proponent for shared decision making. So we decided that she was going to continue those supplements that she had just purchased and had recently started from the functional medicine doctor. But when I was re reviewing the foods that she reported that were triggering for her, and I shared a list of some higher FODMAP foods, and FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And simply put, it's a family of starches that are highly fermentable, but poorly absorbed. And we know for the vast majority of patients that suffer with IBSD, about 75% of people with IBSD will report that these higher FODMAP foods are triggering foods for them. So when I shared with her the list of high FODMAP foods, many of them resonated with her. So we opted to begin a low FODMAP trial for at least two weeks, and then we were gonna reconvene via email. She was gonna keep me posted on how she was feeling. If she saw improvement on the low FODMAP trial, then I wanted her to keep with it for a full six weeks. If she saw no improvement whatsoever after the two weeks, then we were going to discuss other routes and other options. The other thing, especially when I see people dealing with IBS, especially IBSD symptoms for long-term, and regardless of other interventions that they've tried, if they're not seeing results, there's a sucrose intolerance screening quiz that's available online at sucroseintolerance.com that I would like them to take and then just email me their results, which she did. And you can see on the image here on the slide, this is actually the results of, the, of her sucrose intolerance quiz. And based on a patient's results from that free quiz, that helps shed some light for me as to whether or not I want to order a sucrose intolerance breath test for the client. Um, 
So we discussed that. I also wanted her to continue with her degree of exercise, also to practice some stress management techniques, continue with that. And we also talked about information about any sort of drug nutrient interactions and depletions and some of the, the common side effects of the medications that, that she had been on for her asthma and her levothyroxine. And we also talked about the supplements that she would continue with from the functional medicine prescriber. So she emailed me those sucrose uh, intolerance quiz results. And based on that, I did order that kit for her and have that shipped to her house. Uh, and as I said, that plan was after six weeks. If she responded positively to the low FODMAP trial, we would talk about systematically reintroducing her higher FODMAP foods. And we would also, the plan was to reevaluate her supplement regimen based on the changes that she was experiencing from the diet trial and how she was responding and feeling. And there was also some outstanding labs that she was still awaiting from the functional medicine physician that she was working with. So after our initial consult in July of 21, I did receive some emails from her. She was asking some clarifying questions and she also reported that she was experiencing improvements on the low FODMAP diet after two weeks. So I had responded with, okay, then we wanna continue with that full six week trial and also complete that sucrose breath kit. And once we get those results, we'll reconvene and review all of the additional information. However, she never submitted her sucrose uh, breath kit and she didn't attend her scheduled follow-up with me. And my office did send her some emails to see where she was at. And she unfortunately kind of fell off the face of the earth. I didn't hear from her. Two years later, uh, she did reach out to my office and scheduled a follow-up appointment. So she did come back to me after having two years of continued symptoms, um, but a lot of her um, tolerated foods had drastically dwindled. So rather than getting better over the, the previous two years, she was actually experiencing um, a drastic decrease. So she was her symptoms were worsening. She had also experienced a 30 pound weight loss, which was also leading to a significant amount of lean muscle loss. So she had noted in our session that she felt much weaker, her strength, her endurance had drastically decreased. And she had still had multiple tests done and was still working with multiple practitioners. So that follow-up session in that we had this year, our first follow-up session after two years, we did spend a, a big chunk of that hour that she had scheduled really reviewing what she had been doing and what was going on over the last two years since I had seen her and what was going on with uh, the tests and the interventions she was experiencing with other practitioners. So it, it ended up being 22 months since our uh, first and only session. And she did schedule a follow-up visit with me, which occurred on May of this year. So she had sent me an email with her goals, her hopes, and her wishes for circling back with me after a two-year hiatus. And she also shared with me that she had seen her functional medicine doctor in February. And um, the suspicion or what they, the assumption that they were working on was that her digestive tract was breaking fibers into short chain fatty acids. There was a suspicion of mitochondrial dysbiosis. And uh, the physician was also suspecting some mast cell activation syndrome. Um, she had some additional testing done. We'll look at that in a moment. So there was an addition of a probiotic because her secretory IgA level was low. And then in, as of April, she didn't respond well to the probiotic prebiotic product that that prescriber had given her. Um, so at that point, the functional doctor felt that they wanted to check, send her to an immunologist because he really felt that there was some uh, immunological issues going on. And her medications remained the same. She was still on her Claritin, her Flonase, her Advair, and her levothyroxine. So she had sent me a lengthy Excel spreadsheet that listed all of the foods that she was reacting to, as well as foods that she could no longer eat and what the list of currently tolerated foods was. 
So as you can see here, this was the list of foods that she was reacting to. And this list, quite honestly, was far greater than what the list she had reported to me verbally during our first session. And then there were foods that she had been able to eat prior, but now over the last two years, she could no longer eat. So that included honey and corn, brown rice she could no longer eat. She really preferred to be as plant-based as possible. So she was getting a little discouraged that a lot of her plant-based proteins were also starting to cause more and more symptoms. And um, chocolate, honey, these were all things that were causing triggers for her. And then she shared with me the list of foods that she could eat. So she was able to tolerate meat. She was drinking a lot of bone broth. Um, even some of the, the vegetables that she had liked previously, that was also uh, narrowly decreasing. So in January of 2023, her functional medicine physician ordered a doctor's data stool test for her. So these are the results of, of her stool kit. Um, it was negative for yeast. She was negative for any pathogens. She was also negative for any parasites. Um, but from a commensal bacterial perspective, she, she didn't have any dysbiotic flora, but she did have some commensal bacteria that was a little out of balance. So it, it just reinforced to her functional medicine doc that there was still an element of uh, a degree of dysbiosis occurring. And then when we look at um, just some of the chemistries in her stool kit, you can see here that, that she did have uh, her digestive and absorptive markers looked okay. Her inflammatory markers looked good. Her secretory IgA was, was very low at 17. Her short chain fatty acids, so there was a couple of markers there that um, just, just coincide and correlated to the imbalance that we were seeing in her commensal flora. And her other markers were, were normal. However, the consistency was loose and watery. So she was still experiencing the, the diarrhea, even on the stool kit that she had submitted. So the next few slides outline the very lengthy list of supplements that she was prescribed by the, this other provider. So she was placed on a probiotic, she was placed on vitamin D, uh, a multivitamin, a zinc, fish oil. They also, she was still on that progesterone cream, L-glutamine powder. Uh, she was, this product here, BPC-157 is uh, a product that's made to help GI support. So it's help, it's aimed to help with digestion. She was also placed on a product called Biocidin, which essentially is a botanical antimicrobial that is aimed to help with rebalancing her commensal flora. She was put on DGL licorice. She was also given uh, the uh, orthobiotic. So she had a couple of different probiotics as well as a prebiotic. And then the SBI caps. Um, so you can see she was on a lengthy list of supplements that she was taking on a daily basis. So that follow-up session that she scheduled with me in May, a good chunk of that 60 minutes was really talking and focusing on what she had done and where she had been over the previous two years. However, one of the things that was glaringly obvious was one that she had never submitted that sucrose breath test kit that I had sent to her. And two, she had experienced improvements on the low FODMAP trial, but she didn't stick with it. And she admitted that she was really overwhelmed with the amount of providers that she was working with and the uh, degree of interventions and suggestions. So she, she stuck with the, the one physician and just kind of put everything to the side. So I had reminded her of, you know, my, my first suspicion about the potential for starch intolerance or sucrose intolerance. So the kit that she had 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 now expired. So I did order her a second kit, had it shipped to her. And this time 
she did do it. So you can see here the results of her sucrose intolerance test. It, it is a breath test. So there are specific instructions that they follow. Patients will follow the day before. It's a kit that they do at home. And it requires them to actually drink a sucrose substrate. So it really is a sugar solution. And the test kit comes with multiple test tubes for them to collect and to breathe into. So they do a baseline exhalation into the first test tube. Then they drink the sugar solution. And at times intervals, they will um, collect more samples of their breath and then send it in. So for her, she did have uh, an increase in her methane level and the lab. And anytime I get a, a result, I always do a debrief call with the clinical supervisor of the lab to confirm that everything was done properly. And uh, the lab was calling this that sucrose intolerance was suspected. So technically, this is a, pro a positive breath test for sucrose intolerance. So I placed a phone call to her on May 19th and, and did have a conversation for her, letting her know that I did have her test results. And in terms of scope of practice, so it is not within my scope of practice to diagnose a patient with sucrose intolerance. So I explained to her the, you know, what the results were leaning towards. However, we really needed to, for her to get in touch with one of the local gastroenterologists to uh, schedule an appointment with a GI physician so that way they can rule out uh, CSID, which is congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, which is a considered a rare disease, but quite honestly, the prevalence of CSID is on par with celiac disease. So it's not as rare as people may think, but in the GI realm, unfortunately, it's one uh, GI disorder that is often overlooked and often forgotten about. So I did strongly encourage her that as soon as she hung up the phone with me to please call the gastroenterology office and get a consult scheduled as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I also scheduled a session with her so we can immediately go over the low sucrose, the low starch diet so she can start on the dietary plan while she was waiting for the true confirmation from a gastroenterologist. And she wanted to continue the regimen of supplements that she was on by her functional medicine physician, but I also suggested that we add a digestive enzyme product. So I recommended Pure Encapsulations Digestive Enzymes Ultra to her because it not only is it going to provide her coverage from carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, but it was also going to give her a little bit of coverage for sucrose. However, the prescription therapy for CSID is a much higher dose um, of a sucrose enzyme. So my next visit with her was, and she only, only wanted to schedule a 30 minute session, uh, was on June 1st. So we did um, spend the majority of the time going over that low starch diet education. And if you're curious on what that low starch diet looks like, you can visit the ccidcares.org website. There's a lot of information and resources about sucrose intolerance on that website. And then the based on our visit, we had also had some emails in between and we also revisited the supplements that she was taking. So uh, based on that whole follow-up, we had discussed that she was going to continue to use the digestive enzymes. Um, I had reiterated to her that when she was taking her vitamin D supplement, that she absolutely needed to take that with a meal that, had con that contains fat because it is a fat-soluble vitamin. Turns out she had admitted that she was taking that on an empty stomach. Um, I, I never like discontinuing or recommend discontinuing products that another provider has prescribed or has started somebody on it. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of just a, an ethical issue for me, in my opinion. So if I'm recommending that they discontinue something, I give them some talking points to take back to the person who recommended that and then gave her some instructions on some of the supplements that, that she was using and then there were two additional products that we did talk about because she was reporting some concerns about the cost of all these products. So um, she wanted a different option from the glutamine powder 
that she was using. She was tired of using some powdered based and, and having to mix them all and drink all of these products throughout the day. So I did give her some options. So one of them is a product called um, permeability factors from integrative therapeutics. And then another product option that I had suggested for her to help with gut healing was Mega Mucosa, which is uh, made by Microbiome Labs. So we had talked about using both of these products to really help improve her gut health. And then my most recent visit with her was just last week. So saw her in May and then didn't see her over the summer. At this point, her weight had gone down to 122. Um, it had taken some time to get her actually into the gastroenterologist's office, and she was still getting you know, really scared with what foods she could or could not eat. So she was only sticking with safe foods, even though I had encouraged her to really stick with the low sucrose diet education that we had talked about in May. She did get in to see the, the gastro and she did have a, an endoscopy. So the biopsies did confirm that she does in fact have CSID. But unfortunately, it took almost two months for her to get the prescription approved and filled for Sucrate, which is the only medication that's available for these patients. And it's the prescription enzymatic replacement to help them with their starch intolerance. So she's been on the Sucrate now for a few weeks and she reported that she was seeing improvements and that her symptoms were markedly better. But now rather than dealing with more, con uh, more diarrhea, she was occasionally getting constip constipated. And it turns out it was really because she was not getting nearly enough fiber in her diet. So we did spend some time in our session focusing on some fiber sources. And we, she had mentioned that she was now starting to liberalize. Now that she's on the Sucrate, she was able to start bringing back more foods into her diet. So with that, we were also looking at the lists of foods that she was still avoiding because of some of her other providers. She did do one of those direct-to-consumer food sensitivity tests, which unfortunately just kind of made her even more scared. So it just worsened uh, her food phobia because it lit up like a Christmas tree. And unfortunately, that's usually a result of increased intestinal permeability as really as a result of her CSID. So because of the degree of, of inflammation and irritation in her digestive tract, because of these 10 plus years of being undiagnosed with CSID, You'll find that a lot of folks, if they're dealing with intestinal permeability issues and they do these uh, direct-to-consumer food sensitivity tests, they may light up like a Christmas tree, but they don't, may not always share those results with a knowledgeable clinician to help them navigate through the validity of them. Uh, what is, is truly a sensitivity and what is really a consequence of something larger? Another thing that, that we talked about was her most recent thyroid stimulating hormone level was at 2.9. So that technically is falls into that hyperthyroid. So she, uh, I told her she really needed to circle back with her endocrinologist to talk about her um, thyroid being, you know, now too low, and, because that can also contribute to some GI symptoms. She had changed up some of the supplements. She was tired of taking the three pages of supplements that she had been recommended by multiple other providers. And she also shared with me on Friday that she was no longer seeing uh, some of the other practitioners that she had been working with over the two years. So right now she is only taking her calcium supplement, magnesium. She's using a vegan fish oil supplement, a B complex. She was uh, at the tail end of her bottle of uh, the Biospore probiotic. She was also still using the digestive enzymes I had recommended. She was drinking bone broth multiple times a day and still using her uh, vital proteins collagen. And she was finishing a tub of the Nutribio uh, L-glutamine that the functional medicine prescriber had given her. Um, we had talked about adding psyllium, especially since her she was uh, too low on fiber. 
um, when we were looking at her, the foods that she was still starting to experience some symptoms with, we had talked about changing her digestive enzyme over to Similase BV, which does give some extra coverage for beans and vegetables. Um, the B complex that she had bought from Amazon was not one that, that I was comfortable with. So I had told her, um, and when, if she was okay with switching over to something else, I wanted to put her on Thorne's basic B, uh, because her vitamin D level had gone back down into the thirties. We had talked about a, a maintenance dose for her of really being about 5,000 IUs per day. So we, we, uh, decided to, to go with designs for health, vitamin D supreme. And in terms of probiotics, and we were gonna switch her over to um, Microbiome Labs Megaspore. So at this point, I'll open it up to, to questions from the group. Let me stop sharing or questions, any reflections. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, so one of the questions that I see in the chat are environmental exposures. So that, that's a great question. So when we look at things from an integrative approach, it's also evaluating what we're exposed to from the air that we're breathing, the water that we're drinking, um, what are we exposed to and in our environment, what kind of chemicals are we using in our homes? You know, what kind of products do you use to, to clean? Or are they working in an area where they're exposed to a lot of environmental exposures as well? So, you know, for example, um, are they a painter? Are they supposed to be, you know, are they dealing with a lot of fumes? Are they working in industry? Where, where do they live? Are they in an urban environment, a suburban environment, a rural environment? So for example, for myself and environmental exposure, I live in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. My house is surrounded by Amish farms um, on well water. So when we first purchased our house, we had to um, have our water tested and the, the previous owners only had a UV light filtration system, nothing else, but our water tested very high for contaminants and pesticides from the runoff from the Amish farms that are, are very, very close. So, you know, there's going to be contaminants in our well water, which required us to install a water purification system in our house. So uh, we do want to look at environmental exposures. Uh, another question, how much fat is required when taking a, a vitamin D supplement? So it's not necessarily a, a, a set number of grams, but to, to be safe, you want to chew, you want to consume your vitamin D supplement with the heaviest meal of the day, because that's usually going to be the one that's going to have the higher fat content. You just want to shy away from taking your fat soluble vitamins on an empty stomach because they're fat soluble, so therefore they will need fat for absorption. So it could even be, you know, your salad dressing or a little bit of olive oil or nuts or seeds. It, you don't have to have, you know, 30 grams or so of, of fat at a meal in order, uh, but you don't want to take it on with a meal that you have very low fat, or if you're taking a, eating a fat-free yogurt, for example, that wouldn't be the best time for you to take your, your uh, fat soluble vitamin. So let me see. So we've got questions in the chat as well as the Q&A. So I, I do want to try to go for both of them. Okay. Did she have a GI at the time she first uh, met with me? Is there a reason a GI referral wasn't initially included? So she did not have a gastroenterologist when she first met with me two years ago. I always ask about that and ask for whether or not that that's something that they want to do. Um, due to her 10 years of, of IBS and the degree of her symptoms, I thought it was a good, and her age, quite honestly, I thought it was a good idea for her to be, to at least be established with a GI doctor because um, she was definitely overdue for her first colonoscopy as well because she was over 50 the first time that we had met. Um, and she wasn't interested at that point because she was working with multiple other practitioners. 
and and is the fat in a fish oil supplement enough to take with vit with a vitamin D supplement? So some fish oil products you'll see will have a little bit of vitamin D, but the the amount that I was recommending to her, I would prefer that she would take it with fat coming from food rather than a fish oil supplement. And then the the psyllium that uh, product that we were going to use for her was the now brand psyllium fiber, which has seven grams of fiber per serving for for the scoop. So I wanted her to at least start off slowly. So the serving size or the recommended dose was half a was a full scoop. I asked her to start off with half a scoop for a few days and then work her up work up to a full scoop. And then depending upon the how she was able to liberalize her diet, as she because I always prefer patients to get their fiber from foods themselves than always relying on supplements. My stance on supplements are their supportive supplements meant to be in addition to, not in place of obtaining the nutrients that we're trying to get from our foods. So depending upon how much fiber she was taking in from food, I did ask her to, to keep a food diary and use one of the apps that will help make it a little bit easier to quantify her macros as well as her micronutrients, then we could dose adjust, but start off with a half of scoop and then work her way up to one full scoop. And then she's going to email me in a couple of weeks and let me know how she's doing. Would I consider any other connection between hormones and, and the thyroid to GI? Absolutely. So um, she wasn't interested in, in doing any sort of hormone testing at this point. She's um, really expended a lot of, of money over the years because of the other practitioners besides myself that she's been working on. Um, she did have that thyroidectomy. So, you know, she had thyroid cancer and that's why she had the thyroidectomy. So she'll be on lifelong thyroid replacement. But seeing where her current TSH level was, I did encourage her to circle back with her endocrinologist because we always want to rule out whether or not you know, where her thyroid level is, how much of an impact that is currently having on her GI symptoms. Another question, is there a particular supplement company you recommend most, particular brand or online store? Does it depend on the actual supplement? I mean, quite honestly, Sarah, there is not one supplement company that, that I feel covers all of the needs of, of the patients that I typically see in my practice and I'd say probably about 80% of my, my private practice is uh, GI cases. Um, some of the, and I, I do prefer the professional lines as compared to some of the more common retail lines. Although I do think that there are some retail lines that, that do get high marks. So a lot of times I'll, if somebody, if cost is a major factor, I will do spend some extra time in, in researching products for them and, and price compare. Um, and that's where Consumer Lab can be a useful resource because um, they do do unbiased uh, product testing. But some of my most um, common product lines that I use will be uh, Integrative Therapeutics, uh, Designs for Health, uh, Pure Encapsulations is another line that I like, Claire, Thorne. So th those tend to be the, the major players, but there's not a one-stop shop you know, one product line or one company that I feel that all of their products give me everything that I need. So I do like to pick and choose from a few different product lines. Um, I use Fullscript, which is one of the online apothecary tools. So it gives me access to the majority of the professional lines that are out there. And generally when I make recommendations, you know, my patients will be emailed a recommendation and um, if prices is a major factor, I'll usually give them two to three options for each type of supplement. So for example, if we're needing a B-complex, I'll usually give them three options to choose from. And the products will all be very comparable to one another, but the prices might vary by a few dollars. And if it's somebody who's going to be taking three or four products, those few dollars can add up and, and that can definitely be um, a factor for them. All right. And then Nina had asked, 
in the presentation, her micronutrient levels were not. Yeah, the she did not have like a spectra cell or a vibrant America micronutrient panel. So we were, I only had access to conventional labs and really just the vitamin D. Um, and unfortunately her, her B12 level wasn't, um, uh, was normal. So her B12 level, ironically, given everything was, was actually in the 800s. Now her vitamin D level was low. Everything else was within normal limits or within my, uh, integrative and functional optimal range. So what symptoms caused me to suspect, uh, CSID? So, um, because it's so overlooked and, and undiagnosed, especially with diarrhea. And, and, you know, when somebody is struggling with diarrhea like her, like she was for over 10 years and has tried multiple interventions and not seeing any improvement, um, that's one of the, the indicators for me. And that's why I always ask them, hey, go to sucroseintolerance.com, take that quiz and because they'll answer those questions. And depending upon what their, their radials look like on the results, we can rule it in or rule it out. The good thing is, is if their quiz does trigger that it's worthwhile to do a sucrose breath test, the company that actually makes Sucrade pays for the breath test kit. So it is free. So, you know, I, I explain to patients, it's just one thing to rule in or rule out. It's not going to cost them anything. It's a test kit that they have access to for free. Um, and she had symptoms that did coincide. Um, the unfortunate case here was if she had done that test kit back in 2021, we could have um, saved her from two more years of continuing to deal with these GI symptoms and worsening symptoms. And, you know, uh, because the degree of symptoms were getting worse, it was causing her to restrict her foods further, and she had experienced that 30 pound weight loss. So how do I differentiate between a good vitamin B complex versus not a good one? Um, well, they run the gamut. So, you know, one of the things, I personalize all of my recommendations for clients. I don't believe in a one size fits all, not even a one size fits most. So, a lot of B complex supplement products that are available on the market right now do have quite high doses um, of the, the bees in them. And I may not always want my patients to be on such high doses. And, you know, everybody's on the, the methylation bandwagon over the past few years too. And some folks are taking methylated vitamins when they may not necessarily need such high doses of methylated bees. So there's, you know, I'm going to choose a vitamin product that meets the needs of that individual client. Um, it's not necessarily good or bad. I'm really looking at, you know, what the dosage is in the B complex and determining based on, you know, my examination, um, my clinical evaluation of the patient and, and access to labs as well, um, whether or not they need such a high dose, or do we want to choose a product that, you know, has lower amounts of, of those complexes? Great questions. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? If not, thank you so much for, for joining. I'm going to type my email address into the chat. If you do have, have any other questions, comments, or thoughts, concerns, feel free to, to shoot me an email, reach out at any time. But I thank you so much for, for taking an hour out of your schedule this evening and spending the time with us. And be well, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.